Good morning. Good to see everybody here this day. What a, uh, a wonderful weekend that we have had. We went in from the, uh, the 90s of Friday to like a cool 75, 80 yesterday. Wasn't that just fantastic? Maybe I'm the only one because uh, none of you really were excited about it like I was. So anyways, welcome. I'm, uh, it's a tough crowd today. I'm glad that you guys are here today. Um, it looks like uh, we have a, uh, an amazing uh, time of worship to, uh, with us this morning. I, I want to just extend gratitude to uh, our leaders that uh, help lead us into the throne room. So worship team, thank you so much today. Uh, like you always do. You always uh, are very thoughtful and very precise in how we are drawn to worship God. And uh, just a reminder for you that uh, as when we arrive here on Sunday morning, it, it is about a consistent time of worship that our eyes turn towards him always. And that's the most important thing that we do when we arrive here on Sunday mornings is worship him. And that's not just with music. It is so much more than that. So uh, a couple of things that we want to share with you, just a reminder for you. Uh, we have a digital connection card, lhwc.net. You can use that and uh, you can click the, uh, the icon that looks like a plug-in or you can scan this QR code right there with the dinosaur on there, and uh, you can get directed right to the digital connection card. It's okay if you pull out your phone and take a pic or use that camera to take the thingy and does the stuff. Okay, you can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, it's totally okay. Um, and if you don't know what you're doing, find someone nearby you that is younger than you, and they will help you out. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is just a uh, this is a way that we want to get to know you. And so we would uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, this thing called the digital connection card and our app that we have uh, been working on in just a little bit. But um, so this is just a way for us to, to get to know you. Um, some other things that you need to be aware of. And we're going to leave this up there for a little while so you don't have to take the like do it right away. But um, this coming Wednesday is the very first night of Hope Kids. And so we're really excited about it. We have had a long preparation for the summertime uh, of the teachers and the leaders that have been prepping and getting everything geared and ready to go to help disciple your kids. And they are pumped about it. And so we want you and your kids to, uh, we want you to bring your kids to Hope Kids because it's going to be fantastic. It starts this Wednesday night at 630. And here's a couple of things that you just need to know. Um, first of all, we have a schedule and we have a parent registration form that is uh, located on the table right as you're walking outside of the sanctuary. And that's perfect for you to just grab and go for, uh, for for today, but we also are in need of help with snacks. We like to give kids a snack uh, at Hope Kids, and so we do that with your help, and this is how you would do it. You go out to our uh, Facebook group, and you can find the Sign Up Genius uh, form right there, and that's the perfect way for you to sign up and be a part of what's going on. Um, kids, we also want to remind you that next week is the beginning of Children's Church as well. So you get one more week with me. Isn't that awesome? That's when you cheer and you're excited, right? <laughs> yeah, there was one back there. Appreciate that, Hannah. Um, then next week you can go on and you can go to Children's Church and uh, that starts next Sunday. And speaking of next Sunday, it is our what we're calling Get in the Game Sunday. And uh, we've got a, a couple of things that are kind of exciting about that day. First of all, we want to invite you to wear your favorite sports gear. I did this on purpose today. This is not my favorite sports gear. Um, but I have told you numerous times that I'm in equal opportunity sports gear wearer of polo shirts. So I got one and I had to wear it. 
and uh, NDSU, I think you can all know where that comes from. Uh, Rich Bartholomew in the back and Janice. Uh, they are North Dakota people, and they love their NDSU bison. So I thought today would be like the perfect opportunity to wear the shirt, and uh, that's when you guys will always ask, so did you lose a bet or anything? No. No, I really didn't. Um, but it's just, uh, this is the type of shirt that you can wear next Sunday. Or if you're a, uh, you want to wear a jersey, or if you want to wear uh, something else that is sports related, awesome. Go for it. We're just going to have fun as uh, kind of our su kickoff Sunday for a lot of the different things that are going on. Um, so who knows what we'll see next week. I hope that you participate. Um, if we have any hockey people in the in the crowd, wear your hockey jersey. I'm, I'm excited to see who is a hockey person or not. Um, we probably don't have any of those. Um, but one of the things that we're doing, we're having a great worship service, but we're also wanting to feed you as well. So we're going to have a cookout type food next Sunday. We want you to stick around, but this is a great opportunity for you to maybe invite someone to come along with you. Maybe you have a friend that uh, you have been uh, praying for that they would just find a relationship with Jesus. So this is a perfect Sunday for them to come. It's very, uh, I mean, our atmosphere is very low risk anyways, but it's a great Sunday for them to come. We'll do a uh, cookout and uh, we're also going to bring yard games so that you, if you want to stick around and play like uh, cornhole or what, we're not going to do horseshoes because that's dangerous, but other games, we'll play other games outside and just have a fun time as a church and whenever you feel that you need to go home and watch your favorite football team um, you go for it if your team's like mine the Denver Broncos they played that night so you can stick around all day okay Chiefs fans I have no idea what time your game is and I don't really have a preference <laughs> I know there's a few Chiefs fans in the crowd and uh, so we'll, we'll give them a hard time. Um, also want to remind you that uh, our life groups begin next week. So the 12th through the 16th, our life groups are going to be starting, and uh, that's a great way for you to uh, get involved in the church. But we also are uh, doing a couple of things, okay? So um, we would love it if you are not connected to a life group, that you go out to our digital connection card, if you haven't done it already, uh, and on the very bottom of that digital connection card is an area for comments or, uh, or other types of things. If you're interested in being in a group, uh, type in, in that section, groups or life groups, and then what I'll do is I'll connect with you this week and uh, talk to you about what groups we have, but then also um, maybe you're thinking, I'm interested in leading a life group. You can say uh, a life group leader, and then I'll connect with you about that as well, because we're looking for people that would lead groups. We're looking for people that would be in groups. Now, I realize that we have a lot of things going on, and uh, we want you to be involved. And so they, we want to connect you with the right people, and this is a way for you to do that. Um, so that's, does that, is that clear, and clear as mud on how we're going to do that? Okay, down at the bottom of the contact card, it's, uh, you can type in life groups or life group leader, and that'll be the way that we connect uh, with you this week, tell you all the information about uh, what's going on. Now, I realize that uh, we do have a lot of people involved in groups, and so that's a great way for you to do a lot of things, um, but we just want you to be connected. Okay. We have been uh, compiling our church app. And if you haven't uh, downloaded that app, I would really recommend that you do that. It's called the Church Center app. You can find it on uh, any of the mobile devices where you can uh, download apps, and then it'll connect you to Living Hope Wesleyan Church. And uh, you have to put in your ad or, uh, location and things like that, Cedar Rapids. Um, but... We have started to use that as a calendar of items. We've also uh, started loading sermons on there so that you're aware of what's going on. So we are using this app more and more, and we want you to be aware of it. So if you downloaded it a long time ago and you haven't touched it since, 
Now's your time to revisit that app because we have the sermons and, and a calendar right there. It's been updated and we're going to continue to do more and more things. And the digital connection card is all ran through the app. And so that's how you access uh, some of those things. So exciting stuff. Lots of, uh, lots of fun with all these things. Um, I think I'm done talking about a lot of the craziness that we have going on over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I want to remind you. Parents, when you drop your kids off for Hope Kids, we have a parents life group just for you that is designed for you to uh, grow in uh, developing your family and growing in connection and community. And then we have groups going on through the rest of the week. Uh, isn't God good in all the things that he uh, gives us to do and gives us a par partnerships and things of that nature? Yeah, you guys are tired of listening to me already. Goodness. I can just feel it. I can feel it. Well, let's take a moment and let's pray. And uh, then we will jump into our message today, the cost of discipleship. Father God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you for the ways in which you provide uh, so much for us and the way in which we are just blessed by your grace, blessed by your mercy. And Lord, you provide for us a community of people uh, to be in relationship with when it comes to the church. And so we're so very grateful for that. Uh, life would be very uh, different and very difficult if we didn't have others that are like minded, that are walking along with us. And we're just so very grateful for the way in which you, God, uh, bring us into community. But then also, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, that brings us into relationship with you, that um, has conquered death and sin so that we would be able to have a right relationship and a uh, eternal focus on you and life with you. And so, God, we're grateful for that as well. Your hands and your feet always go before us. And we want to walk with you. Help us with that, God. Help us to hear the words that you want to speak to us today and help us to be changed by it for your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray all these things in your son's glorious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to jump right in today. Uh, Luke 14, 25 and following. Uh, Jesus is addressing a large crowd. And as you can imagine, when you uh, when a person is addressing a large crowd, there's a, uh, a huge amount of diversity within a particular crowd. And I wonder what you think about the crowd that Jesus is communicating to. What would the crowd look like? Would everybody be a committed follower of Jesus or would there be people that would show up to this crowd expecting to see a miracle and not really sure what to do with it? Or would this crowd have people in it that really are just there because someone dragged them kicking and screaming to this event that Jesus is speaking, uh, speaking out at or would there be people that just happened to wander by and said, huh, there's a group of people. I wonder what's going to happen. Whenever there's a crowd, you can be assured that there is a variety of people, a variety of thought processes, a variety of stages of life in that. I wonder if uh, that might speak to us a little bit today as we get into uh, this passage of Scripture. Luke 14, 25 and up to 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I wonder how they heard that that day. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
Well, he, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, will he send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace? In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those are some tough, tough examples that Jesus is using to talk about discipleship. Five examples, five kind of uh, thoughts about these uh, discipleship, discipleship issues. The first example is this. Verse 26. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be my student, if you want to be my pupil, if you want to be my learner, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, prioritize your love for Jesus. Prioritize your love for me. It, it, Jesus isn't saying a nice, cuddly type of uh, statement, is he? No, he, he's using some really tough language, and it's really not an easy thing to hear when we think about it. You have to love him so much that everything else, every other type of relationship looks less in comparison, looks like hate in comparison. How, how can we love Jesus so much and hate our families, even hate ourselves? I thought when we love Jesus and we love others, right? Isn't that what we're taught? Isn't that what he says in the Shema? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with, the heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Oh my goodness, what is he doing here? This is hyperbole. And if you remember your uh, middle school or high school language arts classes, uh, he is using this hyperbole, hyperbole, he's probably using hyperbole. Uh, hyperbole is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. It's used to compare something. And Jesus is using this type of language to help us with a comparison. He's telling the crowd that by comparison, your love that you have for Jesus should be so great, should be so enormous, should be so big that the love that you have for anyone else or anything else by comparison would look less and less. And it would almost look like the opposite and look like hatred because your love for Jesus is so overwhelming. Everything else would look like you hated everybody else. And this type of love brings a lot of questions, don't you think? How would you characterize your love for Jesus? If you were to examine your own life, how would you describe it? Would you say that Jesus, in comparison to everything else, is the number one thing that you love? Does it make other relationships look less? And I'm serious about that. That's a tough question. Would someone look at your life and say, yep, they love Jesus more than they love their spouse or their parents or their siblings? How important is your relationship with Jesus? If you were really honest, how would you define it? 
here's the question that I probably in, uh, like the most, but it's probably the hardest question is, is, uh, is the rest of your life filtered through your relationship with Jesus? Is your life filtered through your relationship with Jesus? So Jesus is saying, prioritize, make that relationship with him the most important relationship. The second example is described in verse 27. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So this one is carry your cross. Um, why do you think Jesus uh, talks about the cross? He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He hasn't died for our sins yet. He hasn't made that sacrifice that is so important. Um, why would Jesus talk about this torture device of the Romans? Well, in Roman culture, if you were arrested and sentenced to die, you would be the one that would actually carry, depending on who you talk to historically, they would say that you either carried the entire cross or just the cross beam to the place that you would go to die. Different historians have different thoughts on how much of the cross was actually carried. But the cross was a form of execution. It's not a good mental image. It's horrific. But if you were sentenced to die, you are the one who carries that cross and you are saying that you are submitting to the authority of the Romans and you are going to go and die. There's a guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote uh, a book called uh, The Cost of Discipleship back in World War II. And he said this. The cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. The cross is not a terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man or woman he bids him come and die. So what he's saying here is that the cross, the cross of Christ and everything that happened um, with the cross is presented to every person at the very beginning of their relationship with Jesus. And it's bidding them to come and die. That when we respond to the call of Jesus, we follow him and we live our lives as he bids us to come and die. And what we're saying is, it's not me who's in charge. It's Jesus. And I submit to his authority in my life. It's this idea of Total submission, not just partially, not just in a couple of things, not just in uh, how I will spend my Sundays for the rest of my life. That's not it. But it's about every single day, every single moment, every single thing about who we are is in submission to the cross of Christ. So carry your cross. Verse 28 is the beginning of our next uh, one is the start strong and finish strong. So in verse 28, it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he, if he, if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation is not able to finish, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Start strong, finish strong. So this is a quite a funny little uh, thing here because Jesus actually plays on the emotions of people and kind of is um, is making a little bit of a joke. Do you remember? Have you ever seen that guy that that does all the work and starts that project, but then never finishes it? And everybody ridicules him and says, look what he did. He started that project, but he never finished it. There's a little bit of ridicule there. Do you hear the sarcasm in that? 
I do. Maybe, maybe my ears are just attuned to sarcasm a little bit more, but I hear the sarcasm here. But the, the idea here is, is that Jesus is telling us that when we are in relationship with him, it's not just about starting it and walking away and not finishing the relationship. It's not about building the project and starting it and then walking away from it and never touching it ever again. This spring, I had the ill-advised opportunity to build something in our backyard. And here's the thing is that I, I took the opportunity to build something in the backyard. And, and not that I can't do it, but I had a timetable. Because graduation was coming up and I wanted to have this project done before we had family come over for uh, graduation. And you know that how hard it is to uh, work on a backyard project when it rains in the spring often. Not easy, not easy because mud messes up everything really bad, really, really bad. But here's the thing is that if I wanted to finish that project, I had to put in the time every single moment that I had the opportune availability to get going at it. And I was not going to let this project look unfinished because I knew that my brothers, my two older brothers would give me a hard time and they'd be like, Chopper, you started this project. When are you going to finish it? But I finished it. Proud and excited about it. If I would have been uh, willing to share with you what the project looks like, um, I would have thought about this earlier and taken a picture, but you don't need to see what my backyard looks like because there's weeds and everything else in there. So I have done zero yard work except for mowing and building this backyard patio. Everything else is like, bleh. but the idea is that the project started and got finished and that was enough. But the idea along with this is that we start something, we have to finish it. Have you ever noticed that it's so much easier to start than it is to actually finish? Like it's easy to dig that first hole or to dig up that first area of ground, or it's easy to turn on the computer to write that first word in the paper that you have to write. Or brainstorming the tasks that need to get done. Or whatever it might be. There's something about the excitement that comes with starting the project. And the truth of the matter is, is that when we start our relationship with Jesus, it's exciting. There's a lot of excitement that comes along with it. And we're jumping into the word of God. And before we know it, we may have read uh, a huge portion of God's word. But eventually... Time wears on and we're struggling. The project gets longer and longer and we make it bigger. I did that. Made it bigger than what I should have, but man, it looks great. The paper becomes longer and longer and we clack the keys all night long. But there's something about finishing. And when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we're not building a tower, but we are being built into disciples, disciples that make disciples. And that's the biggest thing that we miss out on is that we think that we're, that it's all about us being made into disciples, but it's that we might make disciples And sometimes we get to the point where we realize, you know what? I've done the church thing. It's good. There's no giving up in this relationship with Jesus. There's no retirement in our relationship with Jesus. This is an all out commitment for the rest of our lives. Billy Sunday, he's an evangelist and a baseball player. He said that stopping at third base adds no more to the score than striking out. It doesn't matter how well you start if you fail to finish. 
There's no checking out. There's no spiritual retirement. There is this process for the long haul that is called discipleship. And we need to be committed for the long haul. There's no end in sight while we're here on earth. Discipleship ends when we close our eyes on this earth and open them in the presence of the almighty God. This is why, this is why your church takes every effort and every opportunity to disciple. This is why we have life groups. This is why we have youth group. This is why we have hope kids and children's church so that we can invest in your relationship and do it together as a community, as a body of Christ for the length of our lives. It's not about arriving and finishing and say, I read the book and then being done. This is why, this is why we start strong and we finish strong. Verse 31. Our next point is wave the white flag of surrender. Verse 31 says, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselor to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. If he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the army is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. So wave the white flag of surrender. The smaller king has figured out that he doesn't have much of a chance to go up against the, the bigger and stronger king. So he does what he should do, and it's not an easy decision because there is a fear of the unknown. If we put this context in the story, uh, when a king would, uh, would negotiate with a stronger king, there's a chance that servitude could be the next phase of life for the smaller king. This was a huge risk for the smaller king. So what do we do with this story? How do we, when we insert ourselves into the story, what are we really saying is this, is this, is that we don't think that we can defeat God, right? But people, dis, de, people try all the time to defeat God. Think about it for just a second. People try to defeat God all the time by living the way that they want to, by doing the things that they want to do when they want to do them because they know better than God. And maybe for a period of time, that was you. You thought, ah, I got this. I don't need God. I can do this because God doesn't see me. You were trying to defeat God and living on your own, doing your own thing. But we can't defeat God. We must humbly come before him and surrender ourselves to him. At some point in time, we have to surrender. General Robert E. Lee knew that his Confederate army of North Virginia was beleaguered and that retreat had to happen. But his retreat was halted at the hands of General Ulysses S. Grant. He saw it coming. He knew. And so he surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865. My question is, is are you beleaguered? Are you worn out from trying to fight your own battle against God? And it's time for you to surrender every aspect of your life over to him. And I'm talking about every room in your house. If you were to put your life into a house where you have different rooms, your living room, your dining room, your bedroom, your closets that are full of stuff that nobody wants to see, because that's what closets are, right? We stuff things in closets because we want to get it out of everybody's view. Well, and sometimes in our lives, we stuff our closets, our metaphorical, our spiritual closet with the stuff that we don't want God to see. If you've never read uh, My Heart, Christ's Home, 
I would really recommend it. It's a little pamphlet that you uh, pamphlet. I just did this one. It's a little pamphlet. It's a tiny little pamphlet that is really good at uh, explaining this. And if you need a copy of it, I would gladly give you one. But the idea is that there are parts of our lives that we don't want God to see. We need to surrender every aspect of our lives, even the closets that are filled with junk so that he can come in and make home in our heart, our complete and surrendered heart. Discipleship is best done when we surrender ourselves to him. Discipleship is best done when we humbly bow before Jesus and acknowledge that we are done fighting, that we are done trying to do this life on our own. So we give up and we surrender. So wave the white flag. The last one. Are you salty? Verse 34 says this, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how do we make it salty again? It is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. And then he says, if anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. Before the days of refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food. It would halt the natural process of decay, and it preserved the goodness of food. Um, salt was also a precious commodity. It was applied to our foods for preservation, but it was also given as payment to soldiers, uh, Roman soldiers. And if you've ever heard the, the phrase, worth your weight in salt, that's where this is coming from. Um, something that I learned about salt is uh, learned from a guy by the name of Ray Vanderlaan, and he would say that salt was often mixed with manure so that the fire that people would mix the salt and the manure with would burn hotter and longer. I don't understand how that works. And I don't understand why a person would necessarily do that mixing salt and manure, because that means that you have to touch it. That's gross. I guess you have to wash your hands multiple times, but over um, the, this chemical reaction would allow it to burn longer and hotter in the homes of their clay ovens. But over time, the salt would lose the qualities that would make the burning process what it was. And so it would lose its saltiness and it'd be worthless. And so it would be thrown out. Uh, Jesus said on the Sermon of the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. But if he loses, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Sometimes in the course of our lives, something happens that our fervor, our desire, our want to follow Jesus loses a little bit of its fire. And Jesus is saying, don't let that happen to you. Are you salty? As disciples, we have to remain salty. If not, what good is it that if we lose our saltiness, but other to be thrown out? That's not what we desire, but we desire to remain salty. We're to be the ones in our in the life that we live to remain salty so that we can preserve the good, the moral, the truth of Jesus in every aspect of our lives. And we are to mix with the junk of this world to be salt, to be light in the lives that we are living so that the truth of Jesus can burn hotter and longer. My question for you is. Are you salty? Are you salty? Now, I realize that we are all at different places in our discipleship. But what we're talking about today is all something that we can do. We can all submit ourselves to Jesus' teachings, we can all really prioritize our love for him. We can all make it our fervent desire to carry the cross that he has given us. We can all start strong 
and finish strong, knowing that there are times when, when the work that we're doing does take a dip, but that we can start again, start strong and finish strong. We can all wave our flag of surrender. I wonder if there's a part of your life that needs to be surrendered. And we can all desire to remain salty. So where do you find yourself? When you look at this passage of scripture, when you hear what Jesus says in this passage of scripture, do you, do you find yourself saying, oh my goodness, I've got a lot of work to do. Or do you find yourself saying, man, this is a good reminder of how I need to remain in discipleship. And here's what I desire for you. My desire is that Sunday morning is not your only time for discipleship. That there are other places, other opportunities for you to grow in your relationship with him. Because if we're not, let's be really honest. A Sunday morning is only preparation for what this week has in store. But 60 minutes on a Sunday morning is not going to last all week long. We need more in our lives that will speak to us every day, really, so that we can remain strong, start strong and finish strong. So where do you find yourself? My hope is that you recognize the cost and the importance of what this discipleship process really is. And if you need to make some adjustments, let's make some adjustments. So with that in mind, you have some opportunities to say, yep, I'm in a small group. I'm in a life group and that's awesome, but I need something else. Maybe it's time for you to lead. Maybe it's time for you to uh, serve. And there's an opportunity for you to serve. We need people that would be willing to help out in many different areas of service here at the church. Maybe it's your time to just join a group. And I would love to connect you with that. So that's your, that's your goal for this week is to figure out what it is that you need and take steps to progress. Start strong, finish strong. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the truth that you have given us today. There are times when we look at your word and we realize that this is much bigger than we realize. That this word that you are uh, giving to us is powerful. And there's some tough truths within it, God. I pray that it would speak to us so that we would be able to realize what is the, the importance of our willingness to follow you. There's a responsibility that we have with this. We are doing what we call the process of, of sanctification, that when we say yes to you, we are justified in our relationship with you, but the process of growth continues on and on and on until the points that we, re we wake and turn our eyes to you in glory. And I pray, Lord, that we would be able to have that type of focus today and tomorrow and the next day. And so we thank you, God. We thank you that your word speaks to us, that your word challenges us and reminds us of where we're going and what we're doing as we walk with you, as we go through this thing called discipleship. Lord, you are so good. And we thank you. Thank you for the way that you heal us and work in us and the way that you see us as children of yours. We pray all these things in your son's glorious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us in worship today. It's a joy to worship with you. I want to invite you to stand and we're going to close out our time together with worship.